welcome to the Penny Stumps Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm not Christina Hamilton. My name's John Marshall. I'm one of the faculty in the Stump School of Art and Design. I want to make a big thank you to our series partners, Arts of Michigan and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. And you should know that this is the, although this is the last event in the fall series, uh, we will be announcing the winter program online sometime next week, so you ch should check pennystamps.org or the Penny Stamps uh, series Facebook page. The series will resume on Thursday, January 12th at the same time, same place, that's here. And the following week we'll have a special event on Tuesday, January 17th at 5.10 p.m. at the Michigan Theatre presenting Meredith Monk. There'll be a regular Q&A following the talk in the screening room, that's out of the theatre and down to the left to the other theatre um, with Roland. So, uh, at this point, Christina would normally introduce someone to introduce Roland, but I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Roland Graf has been an assistant professor at the Stamp School of Art and Design since 2011. Initially, he was trained as an architect, and he co-founded the Five Person Collective, Assel Creation, in Vienna, Austria, in 1997. Whether he's collaborating with Assel Creation or others, Roland invents and builds platforms, designs objects, intervenes in public spaces, and develops experimental human interfaces. Asso creation uses the street as a common ground or a shared surface of interaction to provoke laughter, inspire wonder, or imbue bodily sensations of instability in the public that engage with their work. Roland is heavily influenced by the Viennese actionist movement and the utopian architectural ideas and artistic experiments of the 1960s and 1970s. Before coming to Michigan, Roland worked as a freelance designer for International Furniture Mag Manufacturers Magazine in Germany and Fred Friedrichia in Denmark, and I probably butchered the pronunciation there, Scottish accent. Um, uh, he also worked on exhibition design projects for institutions such as the Vienna Museum, the Eggenberg Palace in Graz, and the Museum's Court in Vienna. He also spent exactly one day on the job as an art architect for a building in Dubai. He might mention why that was the case. He's shown work all around the world and has won many awards and accolades and is fond of the color pink. In Michigan, we expect no less of our faculty. Okay, so I've told you who he is, and I want to take a slight digression into what he does. And in order to do that, I want to talk about um, federal law. So the federal rules of evidence govern whether, when, how, and for what purpose proof of a legal case may be placed before a trial or fact for consideration. Federal Rule of Evidence 406, Habit, Routine Practice, utilizes two different concepts to classify evidence of an individual's prior conduct. The first is character evidence, the second, habit evidence. We are generally sub suspicious of character evidence for two reasons. One, evidence of a person's character is often highly charged and prejudicial. And two, character evidence violates our society's commitment to the idea that individuals are not bound by past actions in making future choices. In the handbook of uh, the Law of Evidence, published in 1954, Charles T. McCormick describes habit in terms uh, effectively contrasting uh, with character. So that's habit and character. And he says, character is generalized description of one's disposition or of one's disposition in respect to a general trait, such as honesty, temperance, or peacefulness. Habit in modern usage, both lay and psychological, is much more specific. It describes one regular response to a repeated specific situation. If we speak of character for care, we think of that person's tendency to act prudently in all the varying situations of life. A habit, on the other hand, is the person's regular practice of meeting a particular kind of situation with a specific type of conduct. The doing of habitual acts may become semi-automatic. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, I believe Roland's work is about the difference between our character and our habits, and the tension between these statements, which I'll repeat, a habit, is the person's regular practice of meeting a particular kind of situation with a specific type of conduct. The doing of habitual acts may become semi-automatic. And 
Individuals are not bound by past actions in making future choices. Roland puts his thumb on the scale to tip the balance in favor of the latter statement when the repeated specific situation is being on the street in a public place. Roland's work is a form of urban acupuncture or an act of faith because in the face of pessimism, I think he needs to hold on to the fact that individuals are not bound by past actions in making future choices. I think this is what our Stamps colleague, Sophia Bruckner, would call critical optimism. Please give an optimistic welcome to Roland Graf. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, there's very few people that know my work and the law as well as John. Um, yeah. I also want to thank uh, Andrew Rogers, who was the organist today, because he contacted me last night and asked what kind of music I want, and I told him what about uh, Johann Strauss' uh, The Blue Danube. And he refused because that's too much work. And then an hour later, he sent me another email and said, I'm working on it. So <laughs> it's, it's really uh, a difficult piece. And um, I chose it because, um, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, I chose it because it's, uh, one, it's a theme song, a prominent theme song of Stanley Kubik's uh, Space Odyssey. And the other, it's also the Austria's unofficial national anthem. Um, at every New Year's Eve at midnight, it's broadcasted on public radio, and if you're lucky, you can even see people on the street dancing waltz to it. So in this talk, let me fix the teleprompter here. Um, I will uh, represent many feet, and I will mostly talk about my work uh, with association. So I won't, talk, I won't show any project about Dubai. Uh, and as you can see, we are a collective whose members all work anonymously. If you saw our heads, uh, you probably wouldn't think that we work together as a group. But what unites us and uh, what I think makes us strong as a group is that we all love to have our feet on the ground. The same ground <clears throat> on which, unfortunately, we currently experience deep transformations. And there are not just since the elections and certainly not just in this country, uh, tectonic shifts happening right under our feet. And I think with this uh, shift, apparent uh, divisions become even more apparent. Um, I can speak to the historical and um, his, uh, political reasons for these divisions. I'm also not an expert in, in the social production of space. But what I want to do is to show what I've learned through my work with association about the importance of the ground, the physical ground, such as the street, uh, for the social fabric and cohesion of uh, society. And I think, and this is what I will try to show, that the ground is an interface that has the potential to connect us and also to change the perception of each other, perhaps more than any other interface. Uh, before I start, I just want to quickly put my finger on the map because I'm from a very small country. Uh, in fact, Austria is so small that uh, it would fit perfectly into Lake Superior. It's actually three times smaller than <laughs> Uh, Michigan. And there's also many stereotypes about Austria. I want to confirm two that I hear most often when I travel. One is there's no kangaroos in Austria and the other, <laughs> yes, the sound of music was filmed in Austria, in Salzburg. It, it shows at least a Disney version of it. But it also shows a moment in history when Austria turned to the dark side almost overnight and this is something that three generations later, and I have talked a lot with my own grandparents about it, I still grapple to understand. When I prepared for this talk, I had a couple of slides that I just edited out, and uh, because it's, it's, it just takes too long to talk about it. So let me get back to, to association. Um, our collective's work started in the mid-90s in Vienna, when I was a young student, like many of you guys here, like many of my students. And this is when two things coincided, which really became the intellectual foundation for much of our work, and one was Bill Gates launching uh, the operating system Windows 95, and the other was many building owners in Vienna uh, replacing the old windows. 
So as a result, there was suddenly an abundance of windows popping up, both virtual windows on computers and real windows in dumpsters on the street. And at the time, it was very difficult to make sense of this, all these windows, and also the excitement about this emerging internet. So we started to collect all the windows we could get our hands on and um, installed them at this major public transportation hub in Vienna. This was in uh, 19... Yeah, this was actually 1997. Uh, to prevent any copyright infringement with Microsoft, and also it took us uh, more than two years to get the permission for this site. Um, we eventually ended up calling this installation Windows 97 instead of Windows 95. <laughs> for us, working on this large installation was a way to visualize and better understand the nature of the emerging internet. We felt great excitement like many of our peers and friends, but we also uh, felt a certain amount of uneasiness. That's what I guess John means about my pessimism that is always there. Um, because all these windows connected and held in place with wires were only framing partial views. And the images that at least we hoped to see were often lost in endless reflections. So back then we felt reminded to what Baudrillard says about the difficulty to distinguish reality from a simulation of reality, or Nietzsche who makes the case that appearance itself belongs to reality. And today, 20 years after this critique, uh, I wonder, <clears throat> which at the time, even I thought that was a bit stark and pessimistic, I wonder if we actually might be a step further when I think of the world of fake news or post facto politics. I also wonder if we did a similar installation today, uh, would all the windows still be connected and organized in one big cloud, or perhaps more in several smaller isolated groups? One thing I do know for sure is that on a technical level, our installation, Windows 95, was not much more stable than the operating system 95. Uh, those who, who have used it know it was really crashing all the time. In our case, a little thunderstorm was enough to smash this installation into pieces. And this is interesting because if you think about uh, we rarely look at the windows as, as an interface that mediates the view to the street, much like a screen mediates the view to the internet, unless it is broken and doesn't function as an atmospheric control element of the uh, building anymore. This is when all the smell, air, and sound from the street comes in. So when we cleaned up our broken windows in the aftermath of the storm, we were left with a lot of questions. And the most striking question for us was, if it is true that the world of windows, <clears throat> that inner world of windows, there are no uh, material or immaterial, there is no immaterial and immaterial world, just a world as it appears to us, like Nietzsche says, then what happens to our bodies? Working with windows for, I think, more than two years, we really got annoyed with one big design flaw that we saw in the system, which is basically, uh, there's not a single door opening that would allow us to step or reach through. There's really just <clears throat> windows. So, how can we uh, truly connect in such a system? Is sitting at home, uh, remember this was 97, and pressing our bodies against the screen really the most we can do with it. We heard, I mean, there was really a lot of people in Vienna talking about it, and it was hard to ignore, but we also noticed that our critique mostly resonated in the echo chambers of, of, of fine art. Uh, it didn't really resonate much in the field of newer mainstream media, which we actually wanted to impact. So, after Windows, um, we decided to shift gears from critique to action and to build our own interface. And as we were researching for more, uh, for alternative, more tangible interface ideas, we probably had the biggest aha moment of our career while we were walking down a busy shopping street. What happened was we were in the middle of a large crowd standing on wooden trench covers at the construction site, similar to the one you see on the picture waiting for a pedestrian light to turn clean, green, when suddenly we felt a, a really strong, strong knocking from underneath. Uh, people screamed, nobody first knew what was going on. I remember I thought a nail will penetrate my shoe sole. Everybody looked at each other and then started to laugh because uh, we realized there's somebody working underneath the planks. And this is when we realized the most obvious that the ground is the only surface that we are always connected to and that we immediately pay, pay attention to even on a busy shopping street, even in an emotional state of mind uh, in which we are on autopilot and just want to get home. So we took this experience almost literally as an inspiration to build a telematic installation that 
uh, celebrates the unexpected physical encounter on the street, and we call this installation Pump for Pump into Each Other. Uh, it premiered at the Ars Electronica Festival in 1999 as a tactile communication bridge between Linz and Budapest only 10 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, which was the border that divided Eastern and Western Europe for many decades <coughs> after the Second World War. I uh, will show you a short video clip from the opening just to explain how the uh, installation works. Ambiance de fête populaire lors du vernissage de ce pont interactif entre Linz et Budapest. La simple pression d'un pied sur ses planches dans la capitale hongroise fait bouger par internet et vers un hydraulique interposé des planches à Linz et vice versa. So since the premiere at the Ars Electronica in 99, Bump has been shown in numerous places across Europe. And the most interesting installation of Bump, I think, was the most recent one in Istanbul, where the installation bridged uh, the Bosporus between Asia and Europe as part of Istanbul 2010, which, which was the year when Istanbul was um, the capital, European capital of culture. And this was also 11 years after we first connected Bump to the internet. <laughs> This is a bicycle. So this installation in Istanbul was most interesting for us because it was bridging a location that actually needed a bridge. At this location, more than 300,000 um, people cross the Bosporus every day with ferry boats. So this also meant that many daily commuters who crossed the installation on one side saw the installation on the other side as well. And this is it's kind of ironic because <clears throat> initially we thought that with Bump it will be most interesting to connect locations that are geographically, geographically as far apart from each other as possible. And at the end uh, we realized that bridging political and cultural borders in close proximity was actually much more exciting. Uh, so. In response, after developing BAM, we clearly felt that there is a need to create an interface that heightens our awareness of each other in close proximity, kind of an ultra-short-range telepresence interface that makes pedestrians aware of the ground as a, sh as a shared surface of interaction that they're all connected to. For this interface, the traditional and still dominant sender-receiver communication model that everybody learns in school and that basically mirrors the, the functioning of old radio and telephone de technologies was not a good framework anymore. Our new interface was not about sending and receiving information. This was really about providing a common ground, a platform that is both firm and flexible enough uh, to connect everyone simultaneously. We also call it analog computing. Uh, we built and tested many different models of this common ground and then got the opportunity to build a large installation uh, for the second Valencia Biennale in a corded of an 800-year-old monastery. I remember uh, when the construction crew dug the hole for our installation, they found some historic relics and also some bones, so archaeologists actually had to come in, which almost stopped the entire project. And 
Uh, what you he see here is this installation, which basically is like 20 tons of Spanish granite stones on custom designed compression springs. And the uh, granite surface behaves like water, so you just have to dip it with your toes to spread out waves that then take hold of other participants. It's hard to describe the, the feeling, but you almost can get seasick if you stay not, uh, on it too long. Uh, unfortunately, the only videotape that we have from this installation got damaged, so what, are, what I'm about to show is just a few seconds and has some glitches. demonstrate this common ground to more people, we also build a small scale model that mimics exactly the behavior of this granite surface. We have been carrying this suitcase with 20 pounds of uh, leads to almost like lobbies to many influential people looking for an opportunity to in integrate this concept as a permanent installation. And one of the people uh, we showed this model to was Franz West, who was probably the most influential Austrian artist before he died a few years ago. And in his studio, a gallery owner looked at the model and said, this is great, can you hang it on the wall? Uh, we first thought he made a joke, um, but then we realized he was deadly serious and it was us who, for all these years working on the street, were completely igno ignoring the, the business canvas of most galleries, which, as we know, is basically a vertical wall. And uh, this experience provoked us to find a way to get at least some of our work on the wall. So since a square meter is one of the key metrics for real estate, which indicates the value of ground, we thought the most authentic way to bring a piece of public ground, which is pr pr really our primary working material, onto the wall would be to simply mark a piece of asphalt where we knew a construction crew was nearby and ask him to cut out a piece of square meter. So at this location in Vienna, we actually cut out four pieces of square meter. And we also asked him to carefully dig around the pieces without damaging them so that we could lift them on a truck and transport them to a special diamond drop sign, which is, I think, the only of its size in Austria. We used this to cut only the uppermost layer of the road surface, almost like a fish fillet or like a flat screen, uh, to line it with aluminum before placing it on the studio wall. And the, the whole project <clears throat> was really carefully and very strategically planned. So when we had our studio party to celebrate our first wall pieces, we also invited a few curators and collectors, and one of which bought the first square meter for a public collection on the same, same day. Um, so a few weeks later, the same piece was then requested by an office space that I think was a really perfect fi fit for this work because uh, First Data, uh, the corporation that you see here, provides global payment technology solutions, and for us, the square meter, is, is supposed to be like a global gallery payment solution. So we, we are both trying to fix um, the payment problem just in, in very different fields. Um, here you see the, the profile of the square meter was actually how it was formed by heavy traffic over many years. It's only about an inch thick, but very heavy. Uh, almost, I think this one is about like 120 pounds. Um, so this project started as an object series in Vienna and is supposed to expand to other cities. It's a form of currency and exchange project in which we peel away the thin layer of reality that, that we're standing on just thick enough so we can hang it up as a flat image on the wall. Unfortunately, um, this excavating business is, is not very easy. There's a lot of labor that goes into each single piece. Uh, so after the square meter, we got to a point in our life in which we really had to reconsider or at least think about our career tracks and uh, also which, which, which nine to five jobs we would need to find to continue our practice. In other words, we felt the pressure of wearing a suit and getting a real job. And this was the first time that we felt we, we risked to lose contact with the ground. And to deal with the situation, we decided to prototype the experience. So we bought some business suits and installed a meat rail in our studio. And our studio had a big garage door, so that opened directly to the street, and we could always have easy access to pedestrians when we um, wanted to try a new installation before we made it public. Like in Manhattan's meat, district, meat packing district, where we found a butcher that allowed us to use his meat rail for happening. I actually also met my wife in Manhattan, but she, is, she was not a butcher. She was a <laughs> photographer for this installation.
go fucking both sell it together. Like, hey, fucking honey, black guy chilling with my man, hanging and shit. I don't even know what he's doing. So as you could hear, people actually enjoyed hanging on the rail. But only until they noticed that they were slowly losing the feeling, first in their fingers and then in the whole arm. And this is when you had to act quickly and take them down. And this is also when people realized that the business suit had become a straitjacket which, which took control over them. For participants who didn't pay attention to the loss of sensation, it could take up to a month to completely restore the feelings uh, in their fingers. So we actually canceled further happenings because we were a little unsure about the med medical side effects of hanging in business suits too long. <laughs> also, related to business and what it means to do a business trip, we started our own airline project in 2003. This was when Europe's um, first low-cost airlines, Ryanair and Sky Europe, became almost like Uber for us. So we booked any trip we could find for 20 or 30 bucks and our self-assigned business or mission was to drag chalk bags uh, across the ground of as many cheap airline destinations as possible, ideally places and locations we haven't been to before. So the only rule we had established was to carry out the action one day and to keep a log. And uh, our mis mission statement was quite simple, moving backwards, we edge progress into the earth. But the project <clears throat> that I'm going to show is, is, is not just about leaving a network of white trails behind on the ground like airlines do in the sky. It's also about staging an event that made us vulnerable and allowed us to synchronize our body and perception system with the urban environment. So I'm going to show you. So um, it's really hard to describe, but every aspect of these trips from preparation to return makes them a mind-altering experience. My five hours in Paris, for example, felt almost like a several-day-long trip. It's almost as if uh, the eyes record the trip with a much higher frame rate. And now I have to jump because there's some... It's. It's somewhat similar to what uh, Robert Blood, my STEMS colleague and friend, and I discovered recently during a research trip to Mumbai when we turned on the ultra slow motion function of our iPhone cameras. And to our surprise, what we found out is that we could actually reveal something with it. We could reveal the complex narratives and urban panoramas of the everyday. If you think about it very often, at least I, when I turn on my camera, I, I literally frame 
out or screen out uh, the world around me. In this case, <coughs> I was seeing something new or we were seeing something new. So I want to show a short extract of our experimental film arising from the surface that resulted from this trip. In this case, uh, it was different, so we were actually embedded in the traffic flow, so not active. We had little control over the, our own motion and didn't see what we recorded until later in the editing room. Mumbai is, of course, uh, one of those cities with a very dense public space, which almost demands slow motion for uh, best viewing experience. In, in, it's one of the cities where you see more and get to know people better when you slow down or even stop and let the city pass by, as we did on many occasions. Uh, it's the complete on the, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum is the vacuum or uneventfulness of many museum spaces. And I actually like both extremes. It's just that nego negotiating them can be difficult. I want to show you an example of work that Association has developed for a solo show at the Künstlerhaus Gallery in Vienna. And for this project, we wanted to create an interface between the city and the museum space. Uh, and we wanted to create a certain kind of eventfulness or connectedness, even if there are no visitors in the museum. So we collect, collected hair from hair salons all over the city, many thousand haircuts. We cleaned them and covered the entire exhibition floor with it. And as visitors uh, walked over the carpet of human hair, they contributed to its becoming even more matted. So these are millions of human fibers that connect and intersect and met together to create a web or surface to walk on. It was really not unlikely that visitors stepped on their own hair. Our press release actually said, come to the Künstlerhaus, your hair is already there. <laughs> this project <clears throat> is called Feedwork, and it is part installation and part performance. We used some of the hair to create what we call pubic corners, uh, which we installed in some of the unshaved armpits in Vienna, uh, that not even our uh, Viennese surveillance cameras want to look at. And one of these unshaved armpits is actually very close to another of our installations which we mounted on a basketball cage between the traffic lanes of Vienna City Ring Road. And this is made out of a single 165 feet long uh, yellow drainage pipe. And this is a pipe that is usually buried under the ground. We initially installed this as a piece of guerrilla art in 2005, and in 2013, eight years later, the city of Vienna commissioned us to turn this lettering into a permanent 3D light graffiti and to connect it to the power, public power grid. And by then, freedom has already become a landmark for many of Vienna's youths and immigrants. Interestingly, it has never been vandalized. The only thing that teenagers took down is our installation decks, and they took it down twice. Uh, the small piece in front of, uh, the small wall piece in front of freedom is uh, an art installation, a temporary art installation of another artist who commented on our piece. It's supposed to mimic the US-Mexican wall, you wouldn't believe it. I'm, I'm not sure why the artist chose to erect an American wall in Vienna, especially now that Europe um, starts building its own walls. For us, freedom sign on this fence refers less to a national border. It resembles more a marketing slogan uh, for teenagers that oscillates between fantasy and everyday reality. And as such a slogan, this freedom lettering also appeared in the film Sneaker Stories in 2008 which is a documentary that features this basketball court in Vienna, together with one in Accra in Ghana and one in New York. And with this documentary, the director, Katharina Weingartner, uh, tries to, and these are, these are her words, trace a line from slave trade to American industrialization, from the branding of black bodies to inner city poverty and the Nike economy of today. So in the opening sequence of this film, 
they took our yellow freedom lettering and quite uh, beautifully transformed it into a shoelace, which somehow resembles, in retrospect, because this was many years later, I have to say it more, it looks more like it inspired one of our current uh, research projects here at the University of Michigan that we work with uh, Lab 11 and, and uh, Do It Group. And in this project that we call Internet of Shoes, the shoelace serves not just as a metaphor, like in the freedom lettering, but also as an interactive device that literally ties people together and that also has the potential to turn their bodies into nodes of a controlling commodification system. Uh, one of the applications for our Internet of Shoe project is an experimental swarm light uh, network in which pedestrians can perform collective actions on the street wearing these shoelaces that uh, communicate with each other in a wireless uh, mesh network. I will show you a short video of a first prototype. It's just a, a, a small, small scale prototype that we showed in Hong Kong uh, this year. So our plan is to scale this up and have several hundred people become part of a large swarm light network that moves down the street almost like a giant meter zone. And uh, our goal is to find out what kind of collective action such a network or organism can provoke. For example, how will the coordination or communication work in this network? Can waves of joy or protest be visualized with it? There are also several other more technical applications that we want to explore with this project, such as a human-powered internet or an interaction platform for connected play and dance. The Internet of Shoes is not our only project that aims to highlight uh, the massive data trails that we leave behind when we walk in cities. Bing Prints is another project. But in this case, we use color to highlight the soul's fleeting contact on the ground. Uh, foot trails, of course, are a much, a much older data trails, which are now almost invisible and forgotten, particularly since the invention of the pavement. Uh, and this Bing Print happening, which is one of many that we have organized, uh, was developed for the Art Prize 2011 in Grand Rapids. It was actually our first encounter with the social fabric of the Midwest. And in this happening, participants stepped into shoes that were provided by a local shoe store and ran with pink acrylic paint on the soles over hundreds of white t-shirts. And each piece of Grand Rapids streetwear was numbered and signed. And for the display of the t-shirts, we transformed part of a vacant building in downtown Grand Rapids into a fully functional retail store. Almost perfect if you ignore the S and E typography accidents that were my mistake when I was standing on the ladder. This, this part of the building uh, was, by the way, also used for a shoe store at some point. Um, it was made, I mean, there was really a lot of people from the local community that worked with us, particularly from SideLab, uh, to make this work. And thanks to them, over the course of two weeks, almost 200 t shirts were sold fresh from the street. This, Pink Brain Project also highlights uh, our isolation's through line, which basically, until Pink Brain, we have mostly manipulating, uh, we have mostly been manipulating the ground, the surface of the ground. And in 2014, a few years later, uh, when we were commissioned to produce a new public art piece for the Chariot and Light Festival in, in Folkestone, in the UK, we wanted to try something different. We wanted to see if we can actually penetrate the ground in some way. This is when we came across an incredibly inspiring news piece which showed a big foamy and foul-smelling ooze appear through the cracks of a street in the city of Nanjing in China. According to the report, no one knew what the ooze is or where it has come from. It was almost like a, a miracle. Um, we thought that producing some kind of uh, foam spill like the one in Nanjing would not just disrupt the everyday of a light festival, which there are probably more than flea markets today, it would also highlight the moments our urban environment is out of control, when culture and nature do not mix uh, and, and create a foamy substance instead. So we, we tested a lot of different foam production methods. Matt Kenyon, former STEM faculty and friend and foam expert, who many of you know, was helping us. We just saw a, a great potential in foam that oozes out of the trains uh, to create this incredible social event. Um, and of course, 
uh, we found a way to make it pink with some extreme bright UV active color pigments. When we arrived in focus on the setup the installation at an intersection on Sheridan High Street, uh, we made one big mistake. We decided to go for green instead of the previously tested pink color pigments. So what we found out the day before the opening was that green doesn't activate as well as pink under streetlight conditions, and it left stains everywhere on clothes, shoes, even cars. So one thing we also haven't thought of was how much the wind will blow away uh, the foam. So wherever these foam mountains landed, there was a huge green spot on cars, sidewalks, everywhere. It was, it was really a disaster. Uh, we also anticipated people will interact with the foam very closely and they had concerns that they might turn green. So we had no, no choice. We decided to uh, work without any pigments and let the street light be reflected in the white foam. Um, So during all these years working on the street, we, we got a lot of street cleaning experience. It was almost natural that at some point uh, we would make work with street problems. To explain this project, I will show you a video that the Graz Museum in Austria produced. As you have seen, the social ambience of the red carpet is completely subverted once people begin to walk over the long bristles. Um, this red carpet can, by the way, be rolled up like a conventional carpet, only it's, very, it's super heavy and you need a truck to transport it. The image shows the opening <coughs> of a show at the Jack the Billigan Gallery in Brooklyn, and here uh, we installed the piece right in front of the King's Palace in Brussels. This location is also a very popular selfie site. It animated the most diverse audience from scouts who used this carpet for a 20 minute gym session to rabbits who did their very own selfie session. I think the red carpet is actually one of our most social and interactive ground pieces. This project might now look like a, a jump, but um, if you think about what social ambience you get when you elevate uh, the ground just two or three feet, in fact, <clears throat> 
I built this first prototype, uh, the, the first prototype for this piece out of construction wood that I took directly uh, from the street. And the reason why I think um, this piece, a table, is also uh, an important human interface is because by elevating the ground, uh, the table provides a, a platform for, for cognitive focus interactions that I think uh, work so well because we leave our upper body on and the lower body under the table, which means uh, if you just think about the different ways we can communicate under and over the tabletop. A table is also a very effective um, FaceTime platform. It can also be used uh, uh, as a platform for social media such as wine and beer and, and uh, very good German potatoes like you see here. When I, I created this table uh, that, you, uh, that is shown here, the design show in Cologne in Germany, I did not set out to design a piece of furniture. I really tried to reconstruct like a centuries old interface in its most archetypical and simple form. Reconstructing or developing interfaces from the ground up is, is a dominant theme of aspiration. And here I will show you a video of our Moonride installation, which we developed and performed with a local community for the second Kathmandu International Art Festival in Nepal in 2012. This was before the earthquake. Kathmandu is a city that is used to daily scheduled and unscheduled blackouts and therefore has a very unique relationship to electricity. And also Kathmandu is striving to become a cycle-friendly city in part to combat traffic and pollution problems. Kathmandu is in very high altitudes surrounding, surrounded by even higher uh, mountains, which means all the pollution that is uh, uh, created uh, stays in this valley. Um, so what you see will, uh, is Moonride at the festival's uh, closing celebration. <laughs> We actually showed Moonride uh, like most of our installation in different settings and different contexts. And for example, here uh, at the opening of the Ars Electronica Festival in Linz in Austria, where it grew almost to the scale of a human power plant. Working uh, so much with pedestrians and bicycles, I never thought that Assegration would ever uh, work with cars. But when I relocated to this about five years ago, cars became, of course, a very important part of my daily life. And during one of my Detroit trips, I bumped into an organizer of a car cruise event and uh, he invited Assegration to participate. So in response to this, uh, we were trying to find a way to shrink the fetish automobile down to the scale of a sidewalk spectacle, which, which we are most familiar with. <laughs> So this project is called Rolling Shadows. It's kind of a, an electronic flea circus uh, in which we use solar door cars to play with our shadows and also the image, image of our inventions. Uh, Rolling Shadows has been shown in several public spaces and in two weeks it will be in, in Australia. Here it was performed with, uh, by Brazilian artists in Joinville in the south of Brazil. Você imagina para mim, além dessa coisa da tecnologia, a questão da sua destaca viva, quando fechar o semáforo, pega os trocos. Pode, pode se mexer? Pode. Pode, pode andar. Já pode? Vamos lá. 
that is when it's going to be playing off. Yeah, it always comes back. Um, this piece also has a wall version uh, in which we use these solar toy cars and mount them on an insulation board in forming a pixelated human shadow in, in such a way that the wheels can still spin. And when we first showed this piece, we hanged it close to the gallery window so that the afternoon sun could activate the solar toy cars, which then mimicked the rush hour traffic on the street. And I was really excited about how this wall piece interacted with the street outside, but obviously it was too noisy for the gallery owner, so we ended up, it ended up in the back of the gallery space with no exposure to direct sunlight, which sunlight, in fact, is, is the second thing that I became much more sensitive to uh, when I relocated. I was surprised to see so many office and workspaces with no windows at all, so there was often no connection to the street and no way to synchronize the body's internal clock with the universe. So this lack of sunlight and disconnect with the outdoor environment made astro creation shift from the ground as an interface to daylight as a medium. In fact, it's not, it's not entirely true because we still try to combine both elements in, uh, such as with this project where uh, you see an animated pink sunlight reflection um, on the ground. And it, this piece is called Solar Ping Pong. It was developed by uh, the Daylight Media Lab, which I started here in, in Michigan to facilitate research on interactive outdoor media systems. I will show you a short video that explains Solar Ping Pong before I go on. Thank you. With Solar Ping Pong, uh, we are more interested to infiltrate the world of games and entertainment. And unlike uh, many other artists and designers with similar intentions, we try to do this by focusing more on the hardware than the software or game mechanic. So for us, it was really great to see that the curators of the Japan Media Art Festival this year put Solar Ping Pong right next to Masayuko Umera's hardware development for Nintendo, because this is precisely where we wanted to plant this interface idea for our and also for future generations. So Solar Ping Pong is really based on mainly two premises, and here I should probably give our patent lawyer credit for this, because he was the one who first pointed this out in such clarity. And first, 
there is a, a need, and this is now a little bit more brainy, <laughs> Uh, the, there's a need to provide an interactive media experience that can naturally coexist and augment the physical environment in which it is used. And when we say augment, we mean unencumbered by screens and controllers, so no screen or goggle in front of the physical world. In other words, we think there's a need for technology to coexist with nature. And second, there's a need for sunlight to be the light source of this interactive media experience because it is necessary, uh, we think, to overcome the binary opposition between natural and artificial light, between interactive media on one side and daylight as a medium on the other side. So in other words, we are primarily interested in the nature of technology and the nature of perception, not so much the nature of games or game mechanics or screen-based aesthetics. In fact, for us, video games have even something in common with paintings. They are both limited to the same kind of screen format. So in that sense, solar ping pong as in installation or game is meant to be a critique of the very nature of the screen format rather than its content. There's this beautiful quote by Max Frisch, who uh, was a Swiss architect and playwright, which says, technology is a way to organize the universe so that man doesn't have to experience it. And with solar ping pong and also with the daylight media lab, as the creation tries to do exactly the opposite. We try to build technology to reconnect humans to the outer environment and the universe. So to conclude, I want to show one last project <clears throat> that is currently in development not far from here in Brightmoor in Detroit. And this is a collaboration with Nick Tobia and Michael Flynn. Here we plan to transform a broken, I should say a non-existent sidewalk into an illuminated running play and exercise track. Uh, this is right behind Detroit Community High School where lots of children board the school buses every day and also uh, right in front uh, of the new makerspace, the Brightmoor makerspace. Uh, the speed display, by the way, is for pedestrians, not cars. Uh, this street, I think, and this, this is why I show this project at the end, it highlights what is too often overlooked. Technology, like space, is not neutral. A street without sidewalk is not neutral. It clearly preferences cars. So it doesn't matter if you drive an SUV and never put your feet on public ground or stay in the dead end road of a single social media bubble. The effects on the social fabric of a city are quite similar, I think. In fact, I wonder if the invention of cars created or at least helped to facilitate the urban sprawl in the 20th century with all its social and environmental consequences, then what will or what can to be more optimistic like John thinks we should be. Social media, what can social media create in, 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 in our century? So, if it seems that uh, my only conclusion in response to all these questions is to celebrate the ground as a human interface, then I think it is for a good reason, because the ground will always be there, even in 100 or 1,000 years, long after our other interfaces are gone will still be able to walk on it, to dance on it, and hopefully still grow food on it. How beautiful is that? The ground is the, the only interface that continuously upgrades, that evolves with every step and footprint that we leave on its surface. So cultivating the ground, growing culture on this ground, is important, not just for a few, but for the sake of humanity. And if this doesn't sound convincing, then consider this, the ground is also the only interface that has a force that we can measure that ties us to it, gravity. There's not just a desire or an addiction, there's actually a physical force pulling us to the ground. Of course, we can still look and smile at each other without relying on this force, without even having our feet on the ground. But I wonder, can we, can we really live and build a cohesive society without any, any connection to the ground, without being grounded on real physical common ground? And that's what I don't think so. Thank you.